I don't think it's that. I think it's go. Is it going? Go. Instrumentalization of reason. 
So what we live in today is a, a highly instrumentalized, an intellectual paradigm in which there's a, a highly instrumentalized conception of reason ubiquitously, combined with an understanding of metaphysical nature and of human beings, which is voluntarist, which is the idea that the will is prior to essences, is prior to, to a way things really are. Why? Because there is no way things really are. So anything putatively, allegedly, which we claim to be the way things really are, is actually just the projection of our will. We're doing the creating there. So if we all get together into subjective, we might create the society. We might start to think all of those institutions actually exist out there, but they don't on this view. They're just intersubjectively put together. So um, how do you deal with that? It's not by becoming paranoid and every single thing you know that there's some sort of you know paternalist um, uh, yeah, I mean, orientalist uh, colonialist assumption or something that they stuck there in the curriculum or it's not being paranoid in, in some pious way that somehow this is going to harm my religion. It's um, so that, that, that's not something that we want at all. We have to go about our lives flourishing, being successful. But you have to be aware of it. I think the best way to, 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 to achieve that and to be safe from it is to realise about it what itself what it itself claims if you look really closely. It's self-philosophical, it doesn't really claim it deeply. But if you look really carefully and try to find the philosophical investigation, you'll find that they themselves will, will tell you this, isn't, this, this doesn't describe objective reality. This isn't about the truth, right? This isn't about what is really there. This is about models that you create. And you, you, know, you want a sophisticated model, don't you? You don't want a, a crude model. So you create a sophisticated model. Holding fast to an idea is very important. Understanding our feed is very important, and becoming really knowledgeable about the history of philosophy is really important. John Stuart Mill, um, who I mean, his philosophy is kind of accessible to everybody that I believe in, but I, I highly respect this man as a huge intellect and one of the few people who's really a true and true modernist who is a really huge intellect and who's fair minded and who looks at other people's looks at the opposing point of view and really tries to understand it. And that's actually why at the end of his life he started inclining more to a more holistic view. He's one of the most important theorizers about liberalism and, and about um, uh, and his version of blocking empiricism is one of the most sophisticated versions that there is. But he says the average person thinks that metaphysics and philosophy is the least important thing to them in the world and has absolutely nothing to do with them, no relevance. And what they don't know is that it is the most important, re relevant thing to them. Because if you're not aware of the metaphysical assumptions which are in the air, what's going to happen? You're going to be completely defined by them without even noticing. Right? You're going to absorb them and take them in without even noticing that it's happening. And that means that your freedom, this vaunted freedom, it's one of the modern things to do, which don't ask anyone what it is because it will be embarrassed. But, 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 uh, but this freedom that people talk about, but, yeah, I mean, what, what is freedom? It means having possibilities that you can then choose from unimpeded, right? Unimpeded. But if you're impeded by thinking that reality is something that it's not, Believing falsehoods about reality and, and living and moving and having your being carved out from you within those falsehoods, then you don't have freedom. You can't really choose to, to pursue higher goals. You won't recognize such a thing in the higher. When you say higher, to, to any of us, we're all modern people. I'm not saying I'm somehow magically exempt from this. When you say higher, you know. A lot of people today raise that, you know, raise their eyebrows. What does it mean? Higher. Higher. Charles Darwin, one of his most important things, he, it's a beautiful quote from Charles Darwin, he said, never say higher. 
Okay? Never say higher. It's a very fundamental, important part of the long view that there's no real higher. There's no higher self. There's no higher whatever kind of higher aesthetic state, higher metaphysical knowledge. There's nothing higher except what you yourself decide. I prioritize this. I value this. I create my own meaning. Okay? Do you hear again and again? Everywhere. I have to create my own meaning, an objectively meaningful world. Right? You find that absolutely everywhere. So, uh, so it's a question of, of uh, really having a, a strong, profound, happy belief about things. Realize that because of the nature of modern knowledge systems, they are not themselves saying that this is objective reality. Not everyone knows that. You see, that's like the distinction between popular scientism, like you know those TV programs and stuff that we watch about popular or popular science books, and what real physicists are doing. Right? Now, some real physicists are signed up to scientism ideologically. They believe in it, yeah. but it's not. They know if they're at all honest that it's not because there's something in the actual work they do on a daily basis which bears that out. Because they know that there isn't. There's nothing there which provides any evidence for scientism, right? So, in the popular imagination, for example, yeah. It's a type of religious wonder which is inculcated in us in a very systematic way. That all the scientists, all the scientists, they've uncovered, you know, the, the strings of other dimensions. So there's, there's 14 dimensions of strings, and that's what's really there. Like under all this stuff is like this amazing scientific reality, which is like mystical. But there isn't. There's zero evidence. To this day, after billions of pounds have been thrown into to string theory, we're going down, there's zero evidence whatsoever, empirically, confirmatory evidence. So we have this picture of a scientific world of, which is you know, somehow underlying mystically everything, but that's the real world. It's not rightly there. A lot of the entities which scientists hypothesize about in the scientific, popular science view, are real entities. But the scientists know that they're not real entities. They're not even, many of them, in principle, observable. I don't need to give the example about the multiverse thing. Do you know how much empirical evidence there is of multiverse theory? Zero. Do you know how much possible evidence there is of multiverse theory? Uh, uh, theory? I just thought, zero. They can't even, in, in principle, they can't in principle be evidence. Why? Well, if you found another universe, then it would be part of your universe. How do you have epistemological access to something which is not your world? How does that work? So, we're living under these illusions, and people are getting paid a lot of research money to do things which don't have any reality whatsoever. It's, it's absolute fantasy with you know, lots of mathematical sophistication. There, there, are several, um, there are several books out now about this because there's a perceived crisis in physics. You know, it's not the golden heyday of, of Einstein and, and, and Heisenberg and Giddy. Uh, not the ones from Breaking Bad, so the same. And um, yeah, I mean, there's this understanding, if you look at, for example, I think it's Julian Baggett's book, uh, Farewell to Reality. He's a physicist, and he says, you know, physics is now in crisis because, you know, billions of pounds of research money go into projects which don't even have any in principle possibility of empirical confirmation. They're mathematical models. They're going deeper and deeper and deeper into mathematical models and game theory and chaos theory and this and that. And so, what's this telling us about reality? Nothing. Telling us nothing about reality. But what is the great hoja that trumps anything I'm saying? Right? But again, which people do this hope, they mistake for something else. What's the great hoja of reality? This electric light and 
cars and microphones that don't work and uh, aeroplanes and smartphones. And that's the great frontier. Technology. Now again, this goes to show what they're doing, even by their education. It may well be impressive. I, used to, I'm, I like my Xbox Series X as next as the, as much as the next man, but but uh, is it telling me about objective reality? The nature of objective reality? No. It's instrumental reason. It's pragmatic reason. It tries to create a product, and it does it beautifully well. It's a fundamentally quantitative approach to reality. And you can trace this, yeah, I mean, you can trace the lineage of these views all the way back. In any case, but we've gone way off the uh, topic. Everything connected to everything else. Um, is there any other questions? Some other questions. Yeah. Do you think at the heart of modernity is spiritual sickness? Not just, it's not just a rational claim, but underlying it is a spiritual disease and perhaps the, the best way to respond is from I guess a Muslim perspective is by um, maybe tackling that spiritual aspect I, I don't know what would be your thoughts on that Absolutely so you're saying perhaps it's not really so much a rational thing the reason people are fully signed up to modernity but it's in some sense ultimately a spiritual sickness well look you know having a spiritual sickness is the human condition. We come into the world because Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has a particular purpose in the unfolding of the human life. And it involves spiritual purification. We all suffer to some degree from spiritual sickness. So that we all suffer from to some degree from less than our bodily sicknesses and so on. Um, but yes, one other way to put it is that there's a psychological disposition, which you might say is a, a spiritual sickness, not to accept something, even though you can kind of see that it's true, but, you know, oh, I can't, can't really accept that and, and, and implement my life as when I do this and this and this and this and this, and I wouldn't be able to do this. And and I somehow miss out. So it's a psychological disposition very often. Our, our choices about beliefs are not rational. They are because we are constituted a certain way. That's why the idea that, oh, some philosophers don't believe in the principle of non-contradiction, that means it's not objectively true and it's not self-evident. <laughs> It's an extraordinary line of reasoning because that's about psychological distribution. It's about sophistication being defined really ideologically in a certain way at a certain time and people having the psychological reasoning that we all want to appear sophisticated and like our peers. I did a philosophy degree, uh, BA, and we were taught the skeptical point of view about bivalence and the principle of non all this stuff before we were taught any logic. Is that the correct tabaki? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were told that this is all nonsense before we even had the opportunity to look at it. So, uh, but yes, a spiritual sickness, well, yeah, I mean, traditional understandings of society, but well, society is obviously an aggregate of individuals. So the spiritual state of the society is going to reflect, to a large degree, the spiritual state of the individuals of which the society is composed, the degree of self-mastery that they've been able to achieve. Now, if you have a society which rejects even the idea of self it rejects even the idea of the higher self a priori. And it says all there is is the individual with his rights who has to be, the society is there, the political structures are there 
to guarantee his ability to exercise his self-determined activity, that is to choose what his life looks like, uh, what he wants to have in his life, what he wants to believe about his life, what he wants to believe about the world, what he wants to do. Now, the problem with that is that we really are ordered hierarchically to be the intellect does govern or has the possibility of governing impulse bodily impulse let's say and so yeah, this kind of slams up against reality what happens in a society where the the most important value is, is freedom per se, regardless of what it chooses. What, what happens to the society? What does it do? What does it choose? It doesn't choose. It's not a genuine pluralism. What you see again and again and again becomes a hedonistic society. If you don't give people a true picture of reality and you don't <coughs> enable people to recognize a notion of a higher self, of a spirit, of uh, an intellect, of a part of, the, of human nature which can overcome impulse and anger and prioritize higher goals, what the people, what will almost everyone incline to? And if you tell them, well, there's not really anything beyond the physical nature, they've got physical nature, scientism plus liberalism, but you get hedonism. So you get a hedonistic society. So yes, the society, there's no such thing as a society, there's individuals, but the, the society, in so far as the aggregates of the individual, becomes a sick society. It's, it's absolutely true. Um, because that is not a way of living in the world that is in equilibrium or that corresponds to the way that things really are. So I agree with you, absolutely. Does anyone else have? Please. My question was, um, does Islam face some distinct or special problem with modernity, which other religions might not? And if this is the case... Sorry, could you raise your very dark near quite... Sorry. Uh, Sorry my question was, does Islam face some special or distinct problem with modernity, which other religions might not face? And if this is the case, and what makes it such that other religions don't face this case, don't face the problem of modernity, and how are they immune from this problem? Okay. Well, um, I think it's really more of a, a distinction between traditional religions, which you might say even somewhat pejoratively traditionalist religions, and religions which to some degree, not, not that they come out of modernity, but they are in some sense aligned fundamentally with some of its core principles. So um, this is very clear and, and very famous in in the Protestant Catholic literature. You know, the Catholic Church was officially anti modernist until the late 1800s. Then, uh, you know, obviously the Second, or in the late 1800s, I'm not sure when it started, but, but the Second Vatican Council, one of its explicit aims was to actually adapt the Church to some degree to modernism, to modernity. Um, but then you, you still have traditionalist Catholics. Um, you know, famous writers like Jacques Maritain, like Etienne Gilson, and others like Christopher Dawson, like more recently Brad Fabry, who had that book, The Unintended Reformation, who uh, still adhere to that traditional understanding. And so they, they have really an identical problem, as it were, with modernity, not the modern world, which we all enjoy and live in, but but modernity is a, is a dogmatic philosophy. Uh, precisely the same problem that the, the traditional Islam has. Um, so we, we, there's no offense meant to, to anyone, but I mean, you know, if you take what we might broadly call the kind of Ikhwan Muslimin, and there are many good people who would call themselves that, but if we take broadly the Ikhwan Muslimin understanding of Islam, that is a fundamentally modern form of Islam. And it's quite a nice thing. You know, one would think if we take our information from mainstream discourse that it would be the Muslimin 
and the Sanofis, who are not modern, and who are against the modern world. It's quite difficult. Those are the modern ones. Those are the ones who fully sign up to the model of Islam as, as a, an arbitrary blind faith, as a world religion amongst others, which we happen to be really uh, pulled up. And that, but we are, you know, just as sophisticated as you, I have a modern world. Um, we drive the same creative pickup trucks and use the same advanced weaponry, whatever it happens to be. And uh, you know, we know science and we know all this. Stuff. So there's no critique of modernity, there's no understanding of intellectual history and intellectual anthropology. Um, so, yeah, whereas the Protestant world is the one which broadly speaking, there are, there are many exceptions, uh, many serious exceptions, but the Protestant world is the one that is most closely associated with, with being kind of modernity. Why? Well, because one of the most important early moderns, Martin Luther. And modernism is fundamentally a something which has comes out of religious debates and has religious roots. Absolutely. Why? Because Europe was a place which was so profoundly religious um, uh, until quite a recent date, and, and now it's unrecognizable. Um, but uh, you know, these, the, the, the speed at which the society is moving and, and casting off all received wisdom is, is rather alarming. Um, even now to the, to the people who are doing it, I think, because it's, it's now happening so fast, but not very long time ago, people, you know, mainstream consensus on things was very, very different to what it, it is now. So Martin Luther, why is he understood to be a very important progenitor of modernism and modernity. Well, for one thing, he was an Occamist philosopher. In the late Middle Ages, he had a philosopher, William of Ockham. This is a straw man version of history, but we have two minutes to stay, so have you. So, William of Ockham is a late medieval philosopher who doesn't believe in essences. Right? He's not a nuance of He doesn't believe in essences. There's no real nature of things. And Luther is trained in that system. And um, one of his fundamental contentions is that the intellect itself is mired in original sin. It's affected by original sin, such that it can't know the real natures of things. So what we, what we need is to get rid of all of those false structures of the interpretational, the interpretive, rather, uh, traditions and structures of the Catholic hierarchy, and the church and tradition with a capital T, get rid of all that, because it's based on these false beliefs that reality is fundamentally intelligible, and instead prioritize subjective faith. Now what does that mean? Why is that widely recognized as one of the most important pre-genesis of modernism? Well, it's because what that means is who is the ultimate arbiter of truth? The ultimate arbiter of truth becomes the individual in his subjectivity. So you, re you, 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 you reject the intrinsic integrity of the world, and you make the, the individual the ultimate arbiter of truth. So in that sense, Protestants tend to be very well integrated. Um, not all of them, but, but many Protestants, evangelical Protestants, uh, are very well integrated into modernity. Why? Because that dictum that you know, the supreme value of society is free choice regardless of what is chosen is something that they can fully sign up to. They will take credit for They'll say, we built this modern world with its rights and its alleged tolerance and all that stuff. We, we're the ones who built it. came out of Christianity. They might say, well, it's a shame that people are now losing their religion. But fundamentally, they can take credit for that, for what happened. So that might be a few thoughts about it. But would you like to comment further? Because maybe I, I didn't really get to what you were. Well, you said that, um, so the problem might be that, so traditional religions might face the same problems, or you said identical problems. But if that's the case, then why frame the problem at all as Islam against modernity? Why would it not be that? So, like, what value do you gain from um, framing it in such a way? Why? Like, does it, it seems to me that. Well, I don't. I mean, they just called it Islam yeah. modernity. So, would you. They called it traditional religion. Yeah. Well, that would be the same thing, thing to you. It wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. So you don't think Islam faces a particular external yeah. crisis? Yeah. 
there's immediate fantasy that you know, the Islam needs a reform. And, and it, it, honestly, the people who you know exist within that ambit of, of discourse, honestly, I promise I don't mean to be uh, you know disrespectful to any of those people, but they don't know what they're talking about. They honestly don't. They don't have basic philosophical understanding. They don't have a really profound understanding of the liberalism that they advocate. Um, and they, don't, they know very, very little about Islam. So, you know, there's, uh, there's been, in the last 20 years, a, 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 it's been possible to create this narrative about Islam, about Muslims as being these violent people who uh, are, are reactionaries and who want to bring down the world. But, I mean, God, if that was true, there's 1.7 billion of us. I would have thought everyone would be dead by now. I mean, uh, you know, we're obviously not practicing our religion very well. And I think that's precisely what they would say. I think that they'd say that, you know, they don't know the real evil soul sticks of their religion. And, and, you know, then Sam Harris brings out this whole list of verses from the Quran, which could, you know, notably, he never brings anything out of the Talmud. You know, Charles Moore in the Telegraph, with impunity, you know, he says, look at these Muslims, you know, in one of his columns, he says, they say, do not take the Jews and Christians as friends. And he quotes the Quran. Notably, he doesn't tell us anything that the Talmud says about the Goyim. Now, the funniest thing about it is that that verse doesn't even mean that. It doesn't mean don't take the Jews and Christians as friends. It means don't take Jews and Christians as allies, in a political alliance. And it's talking about a very, very specific uh, context. So, I mean, it's saying don't take Jews and Christians as friends. You're allowed to marry a Jew or a Christian. So you have to not be friends with <laughs> as much as possible. But all, and almost being friendly, <laughs> that would be really nasty again. You know I mean? It's, a, it's not a serious discourse, you know, um, but unfortunately it's something that we are, we've been landed. You know, the problem is, um, I, 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 you know, it, it's not really good practice to talk about things with us. So, forgive me, I do respect the person, and I hope he's not here today. Does Matthew have something here? Uh, Men, you know, that Mehdi Hassan, I don't know, he's a good guy, but, but his problem is that he he accepts the terms of the debate. And then he says, well, I'm going to say something intelligent, as an Oxford educated, you know. And uh, but he accepts their terms of the debate. Whereas the whole debate is a basket case. <laughs> it's, it's not in the first place intelligible, it doesn't make any sense. So that's the problem. If we're going to prove that we can, you know, we can go twelve rounds with anyone because we're also we also need to be option. You know, then it's uh, we're not going to get anywhere with that kind of thing. So we do have the room until eight, but um, what time is it? Eight, it is seven o'clock, um, mm. but no need to stay beyond it, but uh, beyond what you can. So we have quite a few anonymous questions. Um, so I can either online read questions. Out, yes. So okay. um, I can either read out a few, or if you'd like, I can bring the laptop up and you can. If you read them out, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so uh, one of them is: Can freedom be understood as ikhtiar? In which case is as what is as ikhtiar? Ikhtiar. Yeah. In mm -hmm. which case is human freedom doing what aligns with the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Freedom, in this understanding is not the same as ikhtiyah. So the, the question of, of freedom, that question is more to do with freedom and determinism. So that's a metaphysical question. Do we have real freedom or are we actually determined in all our actions? So those who believe in scientism might say that we don't have real freedom because everything is determined by the physical processes which underlie the appearances of our cognition and memory. Which are, you know, our cognition is an epiphenomenon of uh, physical processes. If you want to embarrass the person, tell you that, say, well, what physical processes are going on in, in you when you tell me that cognition is just an epiphenomenon of physical processes? Now, how do you then distinguish between anything anyone says? Uh, is it true what they're saying? And how is it true? 
So, um, in any case, um, that, uh, yes, what we want is our freedom to be used to conform, it's another dirty word in the, in the, in, in the understanding of widespread understanding, is to conform to, to the good pleasure of Rajan Father, what he has, the, the plan that he has for human beings and because Allah Ta'ala wants us to flourish by realizing, by actualizing our human nature. Um, so so uh, th that is a notion of positive liberty. Recently I've been working on certain things to do with positive and negative liberty, the distinction. What most people mean by liberty or freedom today is actually negative liberty. What that means is, and it's you know, famously uh, explained by Isaiah Berlin in his, his article, Two Conceptions of Liberty, one of the most important uh, tracts of political philosophy of the 20th century. Negative liberty just means non-interference and non-obstruction. So no one is stopping me from, they actually sometimes say it this crudely, it's no one stopping you from doing what you want to do, essentially. Right? Now, that is the basis, that is the type of freedom which is fundamentally protected in liberal societies. So it's the idea that everyone is free to do whatever they want to do, which is always heading, interestingly. But everyone is free to do whatever they want to do, um, unless it harms someone else. So it's mixed with the harm principle, which is from Stuart Mill's famous principle. And that, that is basic to, you know, very widespread conceptions of morality today. The average person is well, you know, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, right? Why should we have a problem with it as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, right? So that means, well, you can't drive your car at, you know, 90 miles an hour. That would be an exercise of your freedom. Most of the time, you can't drive your car at 90 miles an hour down, you know, through the uh, town centre or something. Um, so there are laws in that case in order to make sure that freedom is circumvented to the degree that it won't harm someone else. But negative liberty is fundamentally the idea that what liberal governments are here to protect is the right of the individual to do what he wants to do. And the only thing that regulates that is the harm principle. Now, Clearly, human nature uh, and even your gender, or whatever it happens to be, um, doesn't uh, restrict you. And that is philosophically, again, the right left discourse, that means that I'm now a chauvinist because I said that, but I'm, I'm just reporting a philosophical point of view. In the right left discourse, uh, if we were, remain within that orientation, which doesn't make any sense. You know where the right left uh, distinction comes from? It comes from, really, I'm serious. It comes from the French Revolution. The left are those people who stood on the left of the king in the National Assembly, supporting the revolution. And the right were the people who stood on the right of the king, supporting the king. That's the origin of the, of the left right whole thing, which is completely intellectually bankrupt. And all they do is throw, you know, rock next to each other, you know, the left say, you're a bunch of, you know, discriminatory, bigoted, old-fashioned, you know, privileged people, and, the right say you're just, you know, woke and Tifa, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, communist. The, the, the true, there's no sense of actual rational debate. So, you know, the independent says uh, J.K. Rowling is the most evil person in the history of the universe because of what she said. And the right say, well, we should, you know, while accepting that everyone has their rights, we should. 
uh, defend J.K. Rowling if she's allowed to put forward her position. But there's no philosophical analysis whatsoever. There's no actual debate. It's just, I take this side, I've already decided that I align with the left because I feel like it. That's how I identify. And I, I take this side, I'm, I'm, I'm right. You know, what, am I left or right? Right? I'm not left or right. Are we, do we have to align left or right? Why? Because Islam has a vertical orientation, not left or right. doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We, we don't straightforwardly align with the king. Because the king himself is subject to Allah Ta'ala. So there's no rational debate. So I only bring that up because what is it which can circumvent, I mean this in a very serious philosophical way, so please, can we stay out of the, the hysteria of the right there thing, branding people this or that? I, I have to tell you what I think about that subject. Negative liberty, so there's, it says there's nothing which restrains the individual in doing what they want. I'm telling you, if you take away human nature, like Sartre, like the broadly post Kantian philosophy of modernity, that means nothing restrains you. You don't even have a human nature. So some people might want to self identify as a cat. Right? I'm serious. I'm not, this is not you know, bigoted right wing discourse. It, someone might want to identify as a cat. Because there's no human nature. They can do whatever they want. They want to shape their life in that way. So they have the freedom to do so. So traditionally, negative liberty would not only be stopped by the harm principle, it would also be stopped by certain metaphysical facts, like there are true natures of things. But if you take away that fundamental principle, then there's nothing to restrain you. Gender is not real. Human nature is not real. You see, if the debate was taking place on these terms, then, then but we are a sub-philosophical, we are not a rational society, we're, we're a sub-philosophical society. So no one is talking on those terms. The right's not saying, well, I defend essence realism, and the left's not saying, well, I defend the Sartrean constructionist view. They could, they could do that, and that would be much more interesting. At least it would be sincere. It wouldn't just be these you know, this, this identity politics and this moral indignation, the righteous indignation of students saying, oh, I can't believe that's so out of order, that's bigoted, you know. They don't understand what they're talking about. The other side doesn't know what they're talking about. They don't know the, the, the uh, philosophical issue. And you know, all they can do is dress up as a lobster, you know, jump out at a, a Jordan Peterson um, <laughs> talk that's happened in Cambridge the other day, uh, which is, you know, fine. So it's not a rational debate. So um, it's a very sub philosophical society. It, it's only about well, do you have the correct modern orthodoxy, which is constantly being added. You know, what new letters? Have, what new letters have been added to the to the to the? To the you know, I, I have to keep up with this because if, I, if I'm not constantly updating my my orthodoxy, then you know, the thought police will will. Uh, and it's true. That sounds like right alignment, doesn't it? But it's not. You don't have to be aligned right or left. That's just a club. That's just an, an alternative to thinking rationally. So I don't think we should be drawn into that whole um, debate. The next question is, how will the concept of the metaverse affect society? Isn't the metaverse some sort of Facebook thing where you pretend that you're, you're on the screen? I mean, that's brilliant. Sorry? Yeah. But you're not really. <laughs> I don't know, can someone explain what it is? I've only seen a few little articles about it. It's those goggles. Sorry? <laughs> VR goggles. It's a VR thing, is it? You have to wear goggles. You have to wear goggles. Sorry? Yeah, you have to go into Google. The metaverse is like 
but I think it is more convenient, and, you know, without having to get conspiratorial, you know, surveillance, capitalism, you know, you want someone there in the pod all the time. So it's a much easier to, you know, gently direct, in fact, don't feel soft, despotism, gently direct to spending all their money on, on themselves. Um, and, and, and totally defining themselves in terms of what is uh, you know, really a hedonism, masquerading as culture most of the time. Yes, I mean, that, that's a very, very good question. What time is it now? Because I, I don't know. It is 7.22. 7.22. When do you want to finish? Um, possibly quarter to two. That's right. Quarter to two? Um, okay. I'm, I may leave out maybe two or three more questions. And if there's anything very pressing that somebody would like to ask in person, whether you submitted it already or not, um, then inshallah we can get to that at, at the end just before we wrap up. Um, so I'll, I'll combine a couple of the questions um, because they're, they're both about education. So mm -hmm. it's asking, is there an, an ideal traditional education system and mm -hmm. should we homeschool our kids? Um, uh, it's a very loaded question. I mean, is there an ideal education system? We don't want an ideal education system, and perhaps that's why why they're framed in the question that way. Um, no, I, 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 I think now that I've thought about it straightforwardly, no, there isn't a, an ideal education system. Um, there are there's a scale of, of better and, and worse ones, and you know I think. Various initiatives. Um, one that springs to mind is the Zetuna College. There are others um, are trying and making beautiful efforts towards providing people with a better educational system than what is available in their kids. So, for example, their model of the trivium and the quadrivium is a very helpful. Um, uh, set of tools for not only making it possible for real critical thought to become a manifest, a real deeply rooted ability of the student as their education unfold, but those are, are realist tools, they're propagutic, propagutic to the recognition of a realist metaphysics, which is also something which the Tuna College is, is promoting. I, I don't see how any other approach can be grounded in, in our tradition. Of course, a, a realist metaphysics, I mean, that could be any number of different worlds, that's a very broad world. Um, but there, there are different models out there. Of, of course, our traditional education system, where you learn the logic, you learn you learn mantra, you learn balada, rhetoric, you learn grammar, natural, you learn various other parumadova, you learn Alam al Kalam, you learn Usul al Fiqh, you learn Fiqh, you learn Tafsir, you learn traditionally astronomy, you learn a whole range of different sciences which each correspond to some aspect of the human complex. It is rooted in a philosophy of human nature. It's premised on the idea that we do possess a human nature. Um, it's certainly a better model, but should we all necessarily rush to homeschooling? I mean, my one of my daughters is homeschooled, one of them is not. Um, and it's not easy. It's not necessarily a, an easy option because we 
live in a time where people tend to default to these kind of binaries. Either I'm going to be an integrated person in the mainstream, or I'm going to be this very isolated person in my ghetto. Um, on the other hand, it's not as simple as saying, well, let's just try a bit harder to be integrated at the same time as trying to be authentically Muslim. Because that's actually very difficult. You don't have a real intellectual critique and, and you actually believe in most of the assumptions that underlie the identity, then you're not really going to do that, what you're purporting to be able to do. You're just going to kind of disappear into the crowd and become fully assimilated and not really know start to accept the model of Islam as, as just another world religion, which is just my private faith. I don't believe in know if it's true or not. Which is not acceptable as a model of about it, because it's a very basic principle in our tradition, an incontrovertible principle that the Sheikh bin has spoken. Skepticism as an end about God is good. Skepticism as a methodological process, like Descartes, for example, not really about that model, but at all, but uh, as a methodological process to strengthen your faith, and that's different. That's a, that can be, can be. But as Sheikh Bilal, that's why we don't have the concept of, of blind faith uh, and the, the Christian model, the idea that, oh, doubt is just a part of your, your Christian faith, you can't get rid of it. That's not the kind understanding. What's required is certainty. Now, that might seem like an unreasonable demand, but Muslims have never had a problem with certainty. Because there's something in the barter of Islam, of Islamic societies, of the maqam that you visit, of the sheikh that you visit, of the beautiful adab, um, of the, the hikam of, of the sharia, of the beauties of our civilization, which make people very, very certain. There's nothing in the religion like, the, let's say, a, a doctrine of, of a holy mystery or something which is kind of systematically susceptible to cause doubt in people. And you have to then, by an act of will, so that's why Christianity can tend to a kind of voluntaristic understanding of faith, by an act of will you have to force yourself to believe because you don't have to believe that belief. That's not a our understanding. Um, the next one is quite hefty with the remaining time, but we'll see how, we can, um, how many we can get through. Uh, next question is, can a modern understanding of human evolution be reconciled with our Akida? No. <laughs> next question. <laughs> How do we understand on the day we will say to hell, have you been filled? And it will say, are there some more? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it also says that Allah speaks to the earth. He says, right? So that's a, a, there's a, there are differences of opinion. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to translate the rest of it. But, but there's a difference of opinion, certainly. This comes down to a very profound philosophical difference about whether there is a world soul, whether, where is the, if the world itself possesses a soul, or whether, in some sense, the natural world is just blind, um, blind, inchoate, mindless matter. Now, incidentally, the, the modern consensus, including all of that evolutionism, and apart from the adaptive versions, which then call their own existence into serious question, have adapted that assumption about matter for which there is absolutely zero evidence whatsoever. Um, 
So, yes, um, I accept the belief that, that uh, it's very difficult to ground an account of a blind, mindless, natural world, apart from the human aspect of it, in the Islamic source texts, because of very basic references like Paragraph Right? There is nothing when uh, uh, the, the heavens and the earth, again, it's not very accurate uh, because uh, the heavens and the earth, the Sabbath of Samar, the Sabbath, the, 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 the uh, seven heavens and the earth and all therein glorified with his praise. Where in the chain, illa is a boundary. There's nothing but that is a glorified with his praise. Or like a letter from the Sikhir. But you do not understand that. Right. So, doctrines like evolution, which has become one of those sacred orthodoxies, that it's a litmus test, you know, is he a, a reactionary, a bad reactionary who doesn't understand science? Well, if he says he doesn't believe in evolution, it's not compatible, then now he's in that category. Again, it's the product of a sub philosophical culture which has its lists of sacred orthodoxies, which must be adhered to. And if you press the, the firm believers very far, you find that they don't even understand the claims that they're making. Now, evolution is a metaphysical hypothesis. It is not uh, something that anyone has ever witnessed. It's not something that anyone can prove. Um, mostly because insofar as it constitutes a part of modern science and follows the scientific method uh, it has to base its conclusions upon fundamental empirical evidence now there's very little empirical evidence there's a plausibility to a naturalist worldview there's almost a desperation because the only way that you can really apparently sustain you know, be an intellectually satisfied atheist. The, 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 the only way that you can apparently sustain a naturalistic worldview is that you have to believe in that. Now, natural selection, as Darwin understood, has been decisively shown to not be capable of explaining natural evolution. And no no genetic mechanism for how speciation takes place according to a punctuationless account has ever been discovered either. And it's not even really clear how in principle you would discover such a thing. But that's not even it. There's something much deeper, which is that the claims that evolution makes are not really strictly intelligible. Right? Why? Because of the relationship to mind and the world. So, why is it that us products, putative products of evolution, can now turn around and say, evolution is true, it is a fact. If you do not believe in this sacred tenet of modernist orthodoxy, then you are a reactionary. Uh, ignorant now. It's a, it's a fact. It's a, we, we, we know that this is taking place. How did reality, under those naturalist assumptions, become so profoundly intelligible that we were able to uncover this extraordinary fact about the world, which had no very little, only really highly blunding, conjectural, empirical element, and decisively no for certain. When natural selection in its 
account of truth is incapable of rooting any idea that we would have, have we, we'd be able to have access to universal trans empirical truths about the real nature of things. Is evolution just a hypothesis only? Or is it a, a fact? What's a fact? It's something which describes the true nature of things. Right? How is there a true nature of things? On a correspondent model of truth, how do you correspond? What is it corresponding to? What is that? There's nothing there, just blank in great mindless matter, which is there. So how is it true? How is it a true state of affairs? It also based on the assumption that time in the past, what does the evolution require? It requires time. For all of those things are not quite properly lined to kind of go until it turns into proper yarn, lying about kind of 300,000 years later. Right? How how is that possible? Um, it's possible only if we assume that human time, which is the only type of time we have access to, has been exactly the same for the last millions and millions of years, exactly the same as the human time that we experience. But the problem with time is when you subject that to a very advanced, um, any substantially advanced philosophical analysis, you find that extricating time from the continuity of the of the knowing subject as things change is, is really impossible. So what was under, what was the substratum of that change? Well this mindless inchoate matter. Okay. So there's a lot of insight, you know, a hikmat of wireless and what there is some insight. We're not, we shouldn't exist in this black and white family. There is some insight in modern thought. There is some insight, forgive me for the, the strict traditionalist, there is some, some insight even in evolutionary thought. You know, wherever you look, you should try to learn, you should try to understand things. But evolution, as even one of the most important modernist theories, not only in the liberal realm, which is the open society which sets them in its enemies, but also in the realm of so obviously philosophy of science. He, he said evolution is a metaphysical research program. And of course, you know, when he was made a saint of modernism, it was said in Paragraph about it, you know, before he died, he, 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 he withdrew that claim and realized it. But, uh, but the most fundamental problem, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> is in the very idea of speciation. Again, there's, you know, Darwin may have been, you know, a good, you know, when he was on the Beagle and going around looking at different fossils and things, he may have been a good fossil classifier, but he wasn't very thoughtful, actually, when it came to the metaphysical implications of his thinking. And that was the, you know, he came at the right time, he was the right person at the right time, that was the zeitgeist, and it made sense to people at the time. But he didn't really understand any of the serious metaphysical implications. For example, distinguishing different species presupposes that there are principles which transcend the merely empirical, because distinctness is not an empirical property, which inform giving substantial unity, for example, and a substantial unity, and not just like flying all over it, and a substantial unity, which inform the intelligibility of the world. Now, evolutionist discourse already presupposes that the intelligibility of the world rests upon the existence of real metaphysical principles that constitute the intelligible framework underlying it. While it assumes that without thinking about it, it has absolutely no way of even, even appraising that problem in terms of the scientific method. Absolutely no way whatsoever. So how could 
accidental modifications, incremental modifications, right, of inchoate mindless matter create a distinct world where everything's not melded into it. Everything is, you know, I'm, I'm an individual human being. This is an individual thing. That's an individual sky, right? Everything comes under these distinct intelligible categories. Now, that just doesn't work on the model, but our saying that it's true presupposes that that is true. Right? So, who says that incremental differences, accidental modifications, we call, call them physical logic, yield distinct essences? Because evolution has to explain everything, right? So, it has to explain why there is a distinct intelligible in the sense of knowable world. But it has nothing. Nothing to offer on that whatsoever. So the more I will feed on, on evolution that I would say is, do I believe in evolution? Uh, no. But is it because evolution provides a an intelligible in the sense of making sense, a distinct hypothesis. I don't think if you take into account all of the metaphysical considerations that have to be there, I don't think they are even saying anything when they put forward that, that theory. Because you have to sign up to their naturalistic assumptions first for it to make sense. But coming from my perspective, having studied metaphysics for the last however long, their claim doesn't, it's not intelligible, it doesn't put forward a theory which takes into consideration all of the things that it would have to take into consideration if it was something that I could just appraise and then say, yes, it's true, or no, it's false. In that sense, it's indeterminate. That's what I say. Uh, sorry to have anybody. Anyway. Um, so it is uh, almost quarter to. So if yeah. there are any one final burning question that anybody in the audience has, um, I'll follow it now. Thanks. Sorry. Um, I was wondering if so liberalism and authoritarianism um, yeah. both lead to the destruction of belief, right? Um, right. And so how do we think about such a dislikism? Sense of like authoritarianism in today's world without the language of liberalism? Oh, yeah, very good question. Um, so, I never got to the end of what I was saying about the diet earlier, but um, you've you enabled me to do that. So, um, so, negative liberty is opposed to positive liberty. The, the positive liberty is what Isaiah Berlin had a problem with. Why? Because he associates that with authoritarianism. So, that's basically the idea that, well, on a traditional model, uh, freedom is actually a precondition of freedom is that the intellect, the, inter the, 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 the other faculties of the human accomplices, which are spiritedness and desire, spirit is basically anger, is basically the moral sense. You see something wrong, you get angry, you want to correct it, and then desire, um, have to be subordinated to intellect. Okay? So it's a model of self. It's a model of freedom, which is a model of self mastery. Okay? So it's the idea that um, we can't be truly free to pursue our higher goals if we are constantly led off by our anger, by a moral sense which doesn't actually accord with reality, or we're, we're constantly led, uh, led astray by our desire and a hedonistic society constantly encouraging that. We will be unable to have the freedom, even if we wanted to, we wouldn't even be able to pursue goals of a higher nature, let's say spiritual goals or moral goals. So what Berlin does is he completely wrongly equates that with what was going what was the great question of his time, which was the authoritarian regimes of Nazism and communism. And he said they essentially their, their vision of liberty is, is a positive vision of liberty, as in it's about what are the criterion for 
a good within which human freedom should take place. So, you know, in Nazism, it's like the, the Ubermensch, the Nietzschean overman who, um, uh, you know, with all the social Darwinist uh, assumptions that underlie it as well, he is the overlord of the rest of the world, and he should be, and he is by his own nature. And so he needs to go and take over everywhere. And so that, that in a way, is defining the scope of people's freedom, because if you're a German at that time, you're like, okay, that's what I can aspire to. Right? That, so, it's, it's, so what Berlin does is he equates that traditional model of self-mastery, which is a traditional, what he calls, positive notion of liberty, completely wrong with it, has nothing to do with it, with these visions which come straight out of modernity. Yet the problem with someone like Hitler is he was too modern for, you know, he took modernism to its logical extreme. We think of him as this average, you know, he's a modernist, and he's a lot of threat together. But, um, but, but uh, the, the same thing with communism, that, you know, the vision that in that author authoritarian society, which is like the space that you have to be free in, it's what you, you have there to aspire to, is the idea that you're all working to create this ideal workers' paradise, this ideal society by taking over the means of production away from the evil bourgeois uh, capitalists and you know, sharing it all out equally, essentially. And that becomes, you're not really allowed to do to, to exercise your freedom as an individual, except within that paradigm. So they falsely equate this idea of this recognition of any intrinsic hierarchy, like that is intellect is objectively higher, yes, higher than, than impulse. And uh, he, he's trying to say, well, that's, that's the same as that. But I don't have to know. I don't know if that helps at all. Not really? Right. I'll try again. I was, I guess, thinking more in the realm of, I guess, you know, what we're seeing in uh, with the authoritarianism in the Roman world, let's say mm -hmm. China, and, and how we see, you know, activism without the language of liberalism, how do you even go about that? In fact, how do you even yeah. think about activism as a Muslim? Yeah, well, um, no, I see what you're saying. The problem is, you know, we, we, we do exist within the terms of that discourse. I don't think that that discourse itself, that binary, it's nuanced. But the, the problem is that's the way that we think. You know, the liberalist, liberalist agenda is to go and free every self-identification, -identi right? So whether you're Jewish, or you're a Goth, or you're a Muslim, or you're a gamer, it's all the same, it is all arbitrary. That's your self-identification. You need to go and give those people their, their rights, right? Now, there's not, that's not entirely lacking in something which is true and good and beautiful. Um, and, but it's framed in opposition to these authoritarian regimes which are enforcing their view of what people should be and what people should do. Um, I, I would say the, 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 the right thing is to look at what Islam or indeed other, to, I mean, in my belief, uh, not to the same degree, but uh, what other traditional religions say about the intrinsic dignity, let's say, of, and indeed the rights, because Islam has a very rich understanding of hukuk, which is not in any way dependent upon a very different, in some ways overlapping Western uh, conception of hukuk. And there's much room uh, for us to be activists within that really authentic paradigm. Absolutely, you know, I, in my opinion, personally, you know, if you take the many, many obstacles that women face, for example, and that you, know, you see everywhere in the discourse, but I think the discourse is fundamentally unbalanced because, you know, in a society where one in four women go back to work, because of financial necessity, two weeks after giving birth, 
like this one. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a society where there's the hub of a mother. That's pure evil. It's pure evil. Now, you cannot, gra- you, you cannot ground that understanding on liberalism's own terms, really, because that might be their, her truth. She might prioritize her truth. Right? That would be her right to do that. So, you know, you're, you're standing in her way. For example, so, now, that doesn't imply that I don't think it's her right to have a career, as um, some people might assume, because of their binary thinking. But what it means is it's very different, it's very difficult on liberalist assumptions to actually argue morally, to, to put together a moral argument for why that is wrong. From an Islamic perspective, it's very easy. So, what I would say is, do women in this society really have the choice to flourish, or the equal choice, let's say, to flourish on a traditional model of human flourishing in the context of being the center of the family? Am I saying that that has to be what people want? No. I'm saying, do people under the liberalist regime, which is really an authoritarian regime, pretending not to be, but do people up under the liberalist regime really have the choice, the equal choice? Of course they don't. They are, they are compelled to believe in this self-determinative process of creating their own portfolio of life, essentially, where they are really their own person who's achieved this, who's achieved this, and so that's fine, because that's what people want to do. It's true that we are free. We have a God-given freedom to uh, determine the shape of our life. That's part of human taklif. When we go to God alone, we meet God alone. We go to God alone. Right? But what I'm going to say is liberalism with its arbitrarism and with its idea that its freedom of choice regardless of what, what is chosen is the, is, the, is the supreme value. It gives the illusion that what all they're doing is facilitating everyone to choose what they want. But as I said, what that really makes happen is, um, what that really leads to is this dogmatic, metaphysical arbitrarism, where no one believes there is really anything there intrinsically real apart from individual human wills such that you get to a point, am I going on too long? Um, apologies. No, it does be fine. Um, I think Pat, just a, a minute or two extra, because I think there's a, a booking. Um, after Last this. minute. Okay. Right, well, it, it, it leads to a, a, a situation of dogmatic arbitration where people actually lose the freedom to pursue that higher goal. So I went off, but I always go completely off of the, 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 what I'm going to say is I think there's much that needs to be done under, in, in terms of what we might call activism, now, if you look at what happened in Afghanistan, people tell me who, who are very intimately involved with what went on there, you know, there were all these activists who went there trying to free everyone. And in some ways, that was a positive thing. And there were oppressive and Islamic things about the place. There's no doubt about that. But what they ended up doing is imposing this arbitrary model, which basically, you know, the women's football team is like, it has to be this source of like incredible celebration on the same level as everything else. So it doesn't give the possibility of ordering right, uh, goods in terms of real human flourishing. And it tends to paint everyone with the same brush. So as a Muslim, with your actual metaphysical orientation and beliefs, you lose your dignity because you are no better than the God. They're, they need to be free just to have to have activism for them, if they're being oppressed in any way. Apparently, just as much as we do for anything else. In any case, for Salah Muhammad Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. And uh, it was a very, very interesting discussion. I hope that some useful, apart from a lot of the useless things I was saying, but I, I hope that there was some useful stuff in there. Hopefully, inshallah. So, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.